He's Howard Ibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 25 years of experience. And together, we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing conversation about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. We're back, Henry. And guess what? This episode marks the first episode of our second year as the Brief Brothers. So pat yourself on the back. We're, we're still here. Congratulations to us. And we're going to kick off our second year of podcasting. I guess we call it video podcasting with a special guest all the way from London. We seem to be going back to London a lot. Uh, his name is Dave Dye. This is a legend who's been in the business, as he tells us in this interview, since 1985, the year that I started. So he's been around for a long time. He is an art director. He's been a creative director. He's been a creative partner. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about himself. Let's enjoy our conversation with Dave Dye. Well, Henry, we're back with another episode of The Brief Brothers, and today we are graced by the presence of Dave Dye, all the way from London. It seems we've had quite a few conversations in the past year with uh, colleagues and new friends uh, from London, and Dave is, is again with us. I was introduced to you, Dave, via your friend Greg Benedict, who has a regular post on LinkedIn, which is, and correct me if I get this wrong, it's, oh, how, what's what's it called? It's it's some brilliant, brilliant, brilliant advertising. advertising. How I miss you, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, how I miss you, right. And we had Greg on the, we had a Greg on our show and he said, you have to meet Dave Dye. And he introduced Henry and me to you via LinkedIn. And it took us a bit of going back and forth. We weren't talking about through the holidays and now here we are with you. So we're grateful that you're here. Give us uh, give us a, a brief background on on who you are. You know what matters to you. How you got into advertising, and Henry and I will just dive in and start asking some some questions. Right. Okay, let's think about that. So who am I? My name is Dave Dye. Um, I started advertising in 1985 in London, uh, starting off in awful agencies, trying to figure out the first six or seven years how those good agencies did ads that I liked and the ones that I was in didn't. It all seemed very crass and dumb. Uh, and then eventually got into better agencies like Simon's Palmer, which sadly no longer exists, but was probably for a while the best agency in London. Ligas Delaney, um, Abbott Mead, BMP, Mother, lots of other agencies, and then set up a couple of my own uh, after that. Well, uh, there were three questions, and I feel like I've answered probably one there. <laughs> what, what, you know, what, what got you into advertising? You've, you've hinted at some of these things in your, in your blog posts. Share that with our, with our viewers. Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> what got me into advertising? I suppose um, it's, it's kind of weird, really, because it, it sometimes when you talk about these things now, it feels like you're talking about the 1800s. But um, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, when I was at school, I was pretty good at drawing. I was interested in culture I suppose um, and there weren't many creative outlets at the time now there's like thousands whereas then it's it seemed to be that if you seemed creative or you could draw you know maybe advertising and design was what you should should go towards um, and I think at the time and I think particularly probably more so, I think there's more so when I look back in the 80s it was a very revered exciting respected profession you know it was very different um, and there was tons of money in it, you know. Uh, all these things must sound so alien to some of the newer people in it now. Um, <laughs> and um, so, consequently, because it was well thought of and and it was felt to have great power, they would put, you know, lots of money would be put into executing stuff. So you get directors like Ridley Scott making Apple commercials for five million pounds or whatever it was, or you'd get the best photographers in the world shooting posters, and and uh, it seemed exciting and cool so yeah so I ended up I sort of half through kind of starting off in design and making tea for the designers and and trying to figure out what I could do uh, eventually sort of worked my way into some bad ad agencies I'm going to start by asking a question related to our friend Greg Benedict you know he writes this he has a regular post on LinkedIn about advertising great advertising how I miss you and I I, I know I didn't get that one right but that's the general tone yeah. of it and he's he was the one who introduced us do you share greg's sentiment that that uh 
the ads of today pale in comparison to the ones we knew when we were getting into the business? I've, I've uh, well, I've been blogging now for I think it was 2012 or something. Um, and I, I sort of don't want to get to that opinion. It seems such a depressing thing to be one of those people who moans that it's not like it was in the old days. Um, and obviously there's some great stuff around now, but there's not much great stuff. And I think that that a combination of factors like the fact that I can't imagine how much, on average, how much agencies get less than they would have done 30 years ago. Or, you know, if you do a post, you know, most outdoor now, is one color, you know, they use a few color inks, and a bit of graphics and write thousands of words on it seemingly, you know, they don't go to um, an amazing photographer, spend 50,000 pound on an image and then it shows, it seems like it's, the tools have become a bit restricted, you know, the, the, the cost of commercials doesn't seem to have gone up proportionally, you know, it's almost gone down. So, and that affects the people you can use how good are the directors you can use or the photographers have you even got enough money for a photographer do you have to go to use a stock shot there's a bunch of issues like that 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 can't help but affect it and i think that it used to be if you're in a good agency it was almost you could use any seemingly if they liked your script or your your idea for a post or a press ad, you could almost use anyone really there was a debate about would the client pay for Irving Penn, who I never worked with? But, you know, but it didn't seem out of reach, whereas now it feels like it's smaller. And, you know, what can we do for this limited budget to make it seem interesting? So those sort of things impinge on it. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, I, I try and avoid writing about ads today, partly because lots of people do it and it doesn't need me to throw my hat in the ring to say this one's good or this one's bad. But also because it's easier to judge from a distance. So if you'd have talked to me whenever people think is a really great golden era for advertising, maybe the eighties or the nineties, I wouldn't be saying, God, it's amazing. Every, you look around you, it's all, I would be complaining about this thing or that thing, or it seems a bit dumb or, or something, you know, it's only in, with a bit of distance, you think there seemed like there was quite a good, like music, you know, it's the same. It's only when you're out of it and you look back, can you kind of compare and contrast? So, but yeah, certainly, I mean, lots of the things, I mean, it's interesting with Greg's stuff because, you know, I'm a bit of an ad nerd and he posts every day things. I think I've never even seen that. That's amazing. Where's that come from? Inevitably, it's from a similar time, a gap in time, you know, it's 80s, 90s, I think I would say most of his stuff. Um, and it seems to be so fresh and exciting. You know, the best stuff seems to be, looks like it was done when people were having fun it can't happen really quick. It doesn't you don't feel that they sweated on it for two weeks and it popped out. It feels like it just came out of a cool conversation. So I think you're in arguably right about the um, budgets and things getting smaller. And I think part of it is, and I've I've talked a little bit about this, is the the skill has been devalued by by the clients, right? So uh, what I like to say is, you know, the digital revolution, right? Like we all carry cameras in our pockets that are yeah. better, better cameras, you know, objectively speaking than anything you could have had 20 years ago, right? Like, the, yeah, you yeah, know, totally. and, and so this is, and the skill that it takes to be a good photographer is different than the equipment. Um, but people, I think, I think clients fool themselves. They edit home movies at home on, on iMovie. Like I edit this podcast and they think, Oh, that's easy. Like it shouldn't yeah. be expensive, it should, but to do things at a high level, you need people that are experts that are. And I think that a lot of clients are just happy with good enough. Like there's yeah. all this technology out there and they expect miracles to happen. I think we've also, you see it also in just the the client imaginations and I, I hate to keep bringing it back to the clients but ultimately they're the ones that approve the advertising um yeah. but but their imaginations i think have been stilted somewhat because when they see a concept for the first time they're seeing basically what would have been a finished ad 20 years ago right like yeah. the, the totally. comp where before they might have seen a, a line drawing or something or they would have been told the in this 
commercial, this is what's going to happen. And they would have had to use their imagination. Now they're locking in on the production value of this comp that they got, which is not supposed to be the finished. No, album. absolutely. Well, so, it kind of, it, uh, for me, it's interesting because in the nineties, I became aware that in the States you used to present comps. We, we, all of ours were drawings. Uh, I don't know if it's because we were behind or what, but, we would always present drawings. They might be quite good drawings. They might be quite basic, but we wouldn't. And someone showed me the comps that were in the US that were going to comps. You think, A, there was no computer then. So the skill to get those together was amazing. But the downside is it's then done. It's finished. It's dead. So the minute you show talk to the idea with a photographer, say, and he says, well, why don't you shoot it from the other angle and from the top? Or do, you can't because it's already been sold in like that. Everybody signed it off. Everybody's got used to that idea. So, and that's kind of where we are today. So also some ideas would have been killed because the comp didn't live up to, because yeah. yeah. you could, the comp didn't live up to what you could accomplish if you hired the photographer, you know, Absolutely. did the and retouching. It, and in an ideal world, you couldn't find the appropriate material on the net because it hasn't been done yet. You know, you you know, whereas if you go straight to the similar sort of idea, that should be a ba bad thing. You know. So uh, along the line of, of Greg's series of posts, you, you have something interesting called what I liked before I knew what I was supposed to like. Can you talk us a little bit through the background there, your, your thinking there and, and, you know, some of the some of the ads that for you were formative or that you remember we were talking a little bit before we started uh the recording about you know it's really hard to remember ads from before you worked in advertising and i think that that speaks a little bit to the fact that you know the truth is yeah we lament a lot of bad advertising today but i think there's always been bad advertising oh, yeah, yeah. very yeah. few ads that kind of have that stickiness that years later you say oh you remember that funny ad or you remember that yeah. heartfelt ad yeah I, I i don't know where i think i read a book called um when the peddler sings by an english planner called paul feldman which was which was fantastic and he and i think it's this thing that we were talking earlier about is when you get a bit older you become a bit more honest and a bit less worried about whether people think you're cool or not cool or whatever. Is this um, one? This one? Uh... The, the one after that. That's oh, an oh, oh. of an humbug. There's one after that, which is great. Yeah. I'm doing podcasts with him. Why, why does the peddler sing? Why does the peddler sing? Yeah. Um, and I can't remember. There was something in that that triggered me to think. I think, if you, particularly if you're a creative, um, there's a temptation to try and be cool, to try and like the right stuff do the certain, certain kind of things and it it me you know and certainly when i was kind of growing up in creative departments there was a sort of slightly um bad, there was a bad view of design it was like design was a lesser field that was considered somehow and there's a funny enough there's a there's a thing going around twitter that's linked to a thing i put out on bill burnback where he's dissing design saying we're certainly not a design agency blah 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 and the feeling was that's decoration that's just decoration what we do is much more intelligent and thoughtful um and it kind of just made me think well you, you sort of get into a vibe of what you think partly through awards what you think will be awarded and what's good and you see it year on year what's being awarded and you sort of get focused into a certain channel of certain kind of stuff you know you can't just do a cool piece of design because that's too vapid and actually it just made me think well what what did i like when i was growing up what what affected me um and for me there would be lots of things that i probably thought like the um martini commercials i don't know whether you would have had those over there mm -hmm. they're sort of very escapist yeah very escapist i don't really know what the idea was so i would never have admitted i liked them in my 20s because you think, I don't know, it's some cool people having fun and it's shot nicely. I don't know really what. So I could never allow myself to like that. We were trained that that's terrible. The right one was there in line. What does the right one mean? The good one, I don't know, what does it mean? To the right taste, the right taste of martini. Um, and it kind of, and I kind of looked into this and tried to think, Let's just write down what 
I remember, because obviously, as you, as you say, you have to remember them before you remember you like them, which is a, a skill in itself of doing those things that stick with you. And then also what kind of appealed to me, you know, I used to like um, the Pecco Rabanne ads in the States that would be probably because of my age, you know, I would have been a young teenage, 18, 20 year old guy. And there was all these guys on the phone with women having these conversations, all seemed very sophisticated and, and cool to me. And I probably wanted to be like that. But again, they're not the kind of ads that get talked about or, or shared around. In fact, they would probably get pounded if they're on Twitter now. There would probably be all sorts of issues with them. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Paco Rabanne ads, uh, Dave, because when I was reading your one of your uh, uh, where you talk about some of the ads that you liked before you knew what you were supposed to like, and I was scrolling through, I read those ads again and again and again because those were the ads that influenced me. Oh, really? But That's my, but my but my interest because you and I started in the ad business at the same time, eighty five. Yeah. Now, I, I've been out of it now for a dozen years or more, and and I never achieved the status as a copywriter because I, I moved from branding into to a, to direct marketing, direct response, and that maybe not lends itself to the kind of you know copywriting accolades. Nevertheless, when I was first coming across those Paco Rabanne ads in magazines that I would go out and buy as, as a young yeah, man, yeah. my aspiration as a in advertising really was not you know, doing great campaigns, I didn't know how to do an ad, but yeah. I knew how to write and I loved long form. And that was, that was like reading a chapter out of a book. Yeah. That was like literature. It was dialogue. Yeah. So I'm Which jumping now. Well. Yeah. Well, yeah. But then I'm jumping a bit now to your interview with Tom McElligot. You tracked him down, which was great because yeah. he's basically disappeared. And I've worked for two of the agencies that he worked for as a young man. Right. I worked, I worked for Cole McVoy for about five minutes yep. as a freelancer. And I worked for Campbell Methune as a long-term freelancer in the, in the late 2000s, which has now shut its doors. Okay. And I was fascinated by the way Tom was talking about when he got into advertising, his first job was in, in you know, for retail, uh, for Dayton's, I believe. Yep. He said, I had, no, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't know what advertising was. I just, I just knew that I was good at it. And all the women yeah. who reported to me didn't like me because they were all older than I was. And, they resented me, and and yeah. I, I felt the same way. I didn't know how to write an ad. I, I you know, I know how to write long copy. I knew how to write to tell a story, and that's yeah. what the pocket Rabanne ads were. They're stories. A lot of the yeah. things that you pointed out in the, like that two and a half minute spot for Levi's, these two girls going cross country on Route sixty six. Yeah. That's Thank a story. You, yeah. you know, we talk about we are storytellers today. Well, that's the best ads are about telling a great story. So I was really resonating with what what you know what Tom was saying about I kind of stumbled into this. I didn't know really what I liked. I didn't know how to do it. I had to figure it out. And I didn't start until I was in my 30s, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, at this if I were starting out today, I probably would have a hard time getting a job because I'd be considered yeah. too old. You'd be retiring, you know. Yeah, exactly. Gold watch. Um, I was I was uh, racking my brain yesterday thinking about ads like Mainly from the period, you know, high school and college when, you know, before I got into advertising, I also stumbled into advertising, by the way. And this kind of goes to the point you were talking about design. And one of the things that came to my mind yesterday as I was thinking about it was I had a poster over my bed that was a poster for Alpine, which is a audio system for yeah, cars. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a famous poster with a, a red Lamborghini Countach. And yeah. It was all it was was a photograph of this Countach. It had been retouched, and it says "Body by Lamborghini, High Fidelity by Alpine." Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing that, like you said, there's nothing to it except beautiful design. Um, yeah. It doesn't even show the radio. It shows a supercar that we all, as like you know, teenage boys, aspired to someday own. Um, but it's something that I like before I got into the, into the ad industry. And I, and I think you're right. There's a, we, some, I, I think what it speaks to really is what consumers see in advertising versus what we see in advertising. Yeah, totally. uh, and, and the truth is that consume what moves consumers and what sells product. We still don't really even know what that is. Like Paul Feldwick to your, 
to your point, in his books, he's probing at trying to figure that out. Yeah. But it's certainly not the things that we in the industry have a bias towards. Um, a lot of times there's a happy coincidence when an ad is beautiful and we all feel good about it and it moves the needle and sells. But there's a lot of ads that have sold a lot of products that wouldn't, you know, ever qualify for an award festival or something like that. Totally. I mean, I think that you see, I, I think that's one of the big changes to that, you know, when we're saying, is it better today or then one of the big changes today, I think when I started, even if you were in a bad agency, the, the general feeling was, look, we're doing stuff that people don't want to see. They're not interested. So how do we get them interested? Whereas I get the impression now that people think we're doing stuff that people are really want to join the conversation with. They want to talk about with their friends. They're waiting to find out what we're going to say, what our new message is about these cornflakes or whatever it is. Um, so it seems like it's coming from a completely different point of view, which is so consequently if you're doing an interesting story or you're showing a teenage boy an amazing car that he wants to own or it's just a cool piece of design you might engage with it because of it whereas the assumption that people want to know about all these companies and join the conversation with them and follow them and hear what nobody is wrong all the people that i know my kids and they don't want to engage with any companies no more than i did before the internet you know that's the last they'll, thing they they'll should. be glad they'll be glad to if you get their attention and they think it's cool and that's it yeah, yeah. But, they're, but it's not a need that we're fulfilling in their lives and i think dave trot would agree completely yeah, with 100%, that 100 percent with dave trot so i think if it was more if it was a more if there was a more honest start point which is somehow we need to get noticed and get people to you know one of the i did a post or something a while ago which was sort of saying i've got a new way of doing ads what it sounds a bit crazy but it might work you know why don't we why don't we create things that people like i know it sounds mad but in which case why not create some things that people like? why we you know we create we put this stuff out on the internet and hope that people like it but if you're going on tv or on billboard why not do something that people might actually like that makes them laugh or they think it's an interesting story or it's just so weird that they haven't seen, you know, why not do that? It's, I mean, it, and, it, and I sort of say it jokingly, but it, but people don't think like that. They one think, of the, no, no, we've got people's attention. We need to really tell them a lot about us now. I it's think different. that one, one of the factors that has contributed to that in terms of, because as you were saying, things that people like is that usually when there's something that people like, there's some people that don't like, and that creates yeah. polarization. And I yeah. think that one of the variables that has been introduced has been this overcompensation on testing creative, mm -hmm. right? That the tendency of that is just to smooth out any rough edges. Yeah. That is what makes it interesting that some people yeah. like it and, and, and some people hate it. And so I, the analogy I always use is, could you imagine um, the the pilot of All in the Family, which was a very famous sitcom yeah, yeah. here in the states, yeah. with a with a very um, uh, you know non non likable um, yeah, yeah. lead lead character. If you ran that to today's kind of creative testing, I could imagine hearing the ladies saying that Archie character is so unlikable. Yeah. Why why can't he be more likable? And it would have taken away completely the, the spirit of the show. Yeah. They'd get someone warmer. I'm trying to think who they'd cast today. It'd be someone very warm and cuddly. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, I was thinking about your post, uh, Milky Milky Bar, Milky Bar Adult. Adult. And so, for those of you who haven't read it, first of all, I recommend you go on DaveDie.com and read this post. It is a, uh, as I was sharing with Dave before we started the re recording, it was it was like a revisiting a nightmare of my own career because everyone in the business has experienced something like this. And the premise of your post was, why is there this divide between marketers and yeah. creators? And, yeah. and of course, that's an ancient divide. It's not nothing new. We all know that, that you know, marketers come from Venus and creatives come from Mars or yeah, some, yeah. Ver some version of that. And then you walked us through the, the evolving unfolding of a campaign for Milky Bar, a famous uh, yeah. candy bar in the UK, and all the iterations that it took to get to nowhere. Yeah. And and it seemed to me as a great example of, of you know, how do we address 
the so-called subjectivity of advertising. And I'm going to use this as a segue to come back to what Henry and I love to talk about the most, um, creative briefs. Yeah. So one of the arguments, one of the arguments that I make, I think, I think Henry would agree with me, is that, and Henry has said this before, he said, a brilliant creative brief doesn't guarantee brilliant creative, but it certainly vastly improves the odds. Right? Yeah. So the question, the question I asked you is, um, you didn't talk much at all about what the brief was for this Milky Bar campaign. Uh, you might have mentioned it here and there. You briefed in some creatives to help you. If the argument is the tighter the brief, the more likely you are to get to a better result. If that's true, what happened here in this example? That I mean, because because you you took us through all these iterations of of creative, and and the client just couldn't get its head around. It. A couple of them they couldn't approve. Legal got in the way, and they ended up yeah. they ended up with what they where they started, which was pretty much blase yeah. vanilla, yeah. Yeah. right? So where did where did the creative brief? What role did the creative brief play in this process? Was it was it valuable? Was it not valuable? What are um, your thoughts? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's, it's difficult to say because I think that, um, but I, I suppose that that had come about because I don't know how many trade secrets I'm giving away here, but. But there was a, an issue with JWT and Nestle and Outdoor that, that Nestle thought it got to the point where they think they can't do Outdoor. And when I'd grown up, you know, lots of the brands in the UK that were owned by Nestle were doing great Outdoor work. And a lot of it was done by JWT. So I was asked to sort of meet the client and try and resolve this issue. So I kind of went up. I sh reminded them of lots of the great work that Nestle and JWT had done together in the past and thought well let's look at why that's good what were you doing then that perhaps we're not doing now they kind of were excited by their past often people don't know you know marketing directors may go into somewhere and they're not really aware of what was done previously um, and we kind of distilled that down into a few things I think I'd written a, a thing on what we want from a brief there uh, you know it's good if there's some sort of truth I can't remember off the top of my head um, and moving forward, it was like, let's kind of restart and figure out how we go forward. And, and I guess my biggest criticism, of most of the stuff that they were doing is it was just horrendously boring, but it didn't really have any uh, anything to say. You know, they were sort of going out on billboards with nothing particularly to say. And they were saying it that nothing in a really boring way. Um, so. I can't remember the the actual brief that came in, but essentially the the key thing was that it started off to say their their main ingredient. There's more of this than any of the other ingredients. Was milk no, number it's, one? The number one number ingredient one. is milk. Yeah. So so as I say, I can't remember the actual brief how much there was in other than that, but that was the main takeaway for me. Um, which I thought, well, that sounds great. I I you know I've been a, around this brand for have a long you know 40 odd years i didn't know that and that sounds like a positive thing you know i thought it was a sort of gooey hideous uh, sweet bar and it's got a lot of milk in that it sounds quite positive so when you've got something like that from a creative point of view if you've got something tangible that you think you know i often judge these things and think well, if i was telling someone i knew about it would I be interested to tell them or would I be embarrassed if I, you know, if the, if it was, can you go and tell your friends that it's really yummy? I'd feel really awkward if they go, can you tell your friends that it's got the main thing it's made of is milk? I'd think, yeah, I'd happily tell them that. So to me, that's a sort of not a bad um, assessment of, you know, the information we've got to impart. So I thought well, that sounds great. So where do I go now? I don't want to re, re uh, cover the whole blog, but essentially it sort of went. So we went in and they loved the work. You know, we did these really simple uh, ads that showed sort of the milky bar in place of milk in different sort of um, mashups of images that were quite dead simple, really straightforward. And they loved it. But then legal couldn't said technically we can't say that. And then. Then they sort of, we zigzagged and you're then chasing your tail, trying to, you know, accommodate each new sidestep. Um, and then, you know, sort of six, six or seven shots in, 
everybody's kind of lost the plot really and you're chasing whatever the last thing is hoping to get the thing done but the part of the reason I chose that one to do in that instance which essentially my point with that was that it's just so weird that there's that we aren't more aligned in what's considered good or bad because whenever I talk to clients aside from a particular product uh, project there's no difference between what we think is good or bad or what we think it should do or shouldn't do but when you put a you know a joint thing on the table there's a, everybody comes at it with their own um you know their own biases whether it's to do with their job or their bosses or my bosses or whoever it may be and it it changes the dynamic and then it starts to go into a different direction so i, I you know they, i could post and unfortunately i could post endless examples of those where you see something deteriorate or change as it goes along um but that was one where because it was you know i was not trying to chase an award i was trying to use what i'd learned and my skill to solve the problem i wasn't if as i said that was in my 20s i might have been thinking this could be a great opportunity to win x you know this or that i wasn't in that in any way i was really trying to solve it for them and do something that i thought would be good and would help their business and they'd be proud of and and ultimately i guess i couldn't do it because we did 10 rounds um, so, and then they ran some awful thing that could have been done in 10 minutes in the beginning so uh, the lesson that i take away from that is as a brief writer something that howard just alluded to which is that as a brief writer we have to be very humble um it, we, it, the the process does not depend on us um plenty of creatives have done great work with no brief or crappy briefs um, written uh, for an assignment. Um, you know, it's interesting because I searched your site looking for the word brief, and typically you use it in the sense of an assignment, like it's like a synonym. Yeah. Of, we got yeah. the brief, and and there's not much beyond that. And you were trying to recall like what was in that brief, you know, and telling this anecdote. So for me, it would be a lesson to brief writers is like we're not that indispensable um we're not going to be the ones that are remembered um if the if the work is great or if the work is is bad um we have to try to do the best job we can but our, i think our role goes beyond just brief writing um and 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 we can be of help in other ways so i think our brief should be clear and clever if we can make it that way and and memorable but it's not the advertising itself and and so we need to be a little bit more humble well i, I mean it's part, the lack of briefs on my site wouldn't be it's just because i i keep all the creative work and all the scribbles and things but probably not the briefs which is interesting that i don't but i don't um i suppose for me it's interesting hearing you you say that because it reminds me that um you know, if we divide my career in two halves, the first half, the brief was carved in stone. So when you got a brief, it had tons of signatures on it. And that was it. If you'd agree, if you'd signed off that brief, you had to deliver against it. The client had to sign off kind of against it. They couldn't, you couldn't present work and the client go, well, yeah, maybe we should talk about this. Whereas now I think they do, you know, I think that there's less commitment both sides is my impression. It used to be a real, getting the brief agreed and approved by everyone was a real big deal. And I think that my impression is that people are more happy to just swerve around in a bad way, because obviously without that discipline of all following that um, single thought down the line or that observation, whatever it may be. I mean, so. Uh, Dave, are you, are you familiar with a, with a project called the Better Briefs Project? Um, Matt Davies and Peter Paul von Wheeler, they did a global mm -hmm. survey, Australia, New Zealand, US, Canada, United Kingdom, asking both marketers and creative agencies to assess the quality of the marketing briefs, the ones that come in from the client to the agency. And the gap between, it's like perception reality, that old campaign yeah. for Rolling Stone, marketers believed in from the high 70% to 90% that the quality of their briefs was that good and the agencies were at seven to ten percent in agreeing with them so the gap between wow. the brief is good and the brief sucks was huge uh, one of the other conclusions that the survey pointed out that that henry and i really talked about 
well, two of them. One was that 60% of marketers admitted that they used the creative process to figure out the strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other was that they said that 30, 30 some odd percent of their marketing budget was wasted because of poorly conceived briefs. So okay. I think this 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 addresses the point that you're making that back in the day there might have been more loyalty to the brief or yeah. adherence to the brief, whereas today it's kind of loosey goosey. Well, it was the brief was like an uh, an agreed. It was like a something you all signed like a agreement, wasn't it? Is this is what we're going to do? And I don't think it's the. I think there's most areas of the business are much looser for the worse. They're not quite as tight. I mean, um, it's funny. I was I was just thinking of something that I did that I haven't been able to find that might be useful, which is I once did this poster for the uh, account planning group in the UK. And I got uh, 30 different brief templates from all of the major agencies, you know, BBH and Abbott Mead. And we printed them all there and it said something at the bottom. I can't find it. I would be interested to read it again to see how they varied. And uh, well, if I can find it, I'll send it to you. But um, that would be great. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But I, I guess partly because I can't remember what the poster said now, but the point was to, to highlight them all that. The reason was to say this is what leads to all that great work at BBH or Abbott Mead or whatever, to just see what their start points was. And there was loads, loads of, we sourced loads of them in about 1990. So I don't know what they'd look like now, but. Um, you know, I think, well, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say one of the things that, are, that Dave Trott argues, which could be debatable, um, I heard him in a long a 30 or 40 minute presentation he made on the history of advertising. And Henry yes. and I talked about this. Dave said that prior to the, the introduction of account planning, creative briefs may not have existed the way we know them today, but they certainly existed in some form, some way of setting up the project. Yeah. And Dave said back though, back then in the 40s and 50s, before account planning arrived, the creative department pretty much ran the show and yeah. decided what, what the strategy was going to be, what the insight would be, and how the, the approach would be creatively to solving the problem. Do you, do you agree with his thinking there? Um, should that should we return to that? I don't know. No I mean, offense, it, depends on, it depends on the individuals. I think um, it, it's difficult to say. So I used to work at BMP, which is now BMP Adam and Eve, uh, or it was BMP DDB at the time, and that was in the UK. There's a debate whether BMP gave birth to the planners or whether JWT and you know Stephen so BMP, King. Stephen yeah, so King BMP, and Stanley Stephen Pollard. King, the... Stanley Pollard. Anyway, so yeah. I was at BMP and planning was obviously taken very, very seriously. So I would I had two examples on Volkswagen that I worked on. One which was a disaster and one which was amazing. So the amazing one was, I thought was amazing, and it led to good work, was that they they once did big Volkswagen used to do this kind of people carrier, I don't know whether you call them people carrier in the States, the big vans basically that could fit lots of people in with windows. They weren't very good, um, but they wanted families to buy them. And the first year when we did it, they, the brief was, um, the insight was that men, you know, men with families can get these, it's got seven seats and they can, because there's so much space inside them, they can sort of drive around on their own, have breaks and sort of, chill out and get a bit of space to themselves and that was the brief at the time when that was the brief you couldn't just chuck it in the bin and do your own thing so we did ads on these and obviously it's bullshit you know that's not why men would buy these things driving you don't buy a seven seater car to drive around on your own um but that so we did a whole bunch of ads on that and then the following year they came back and they said oh we found out this interesting thing which is the people buying them are trading down from really good cars like BMW 5 Series or, or Mercedes. And they see this as a little window in which they've got to drive this thing because they've got kids, young kids, and it's useful. And then they'll get a good car again at some point. And because it was Volkswagen, we were allowed to talk about that because they were sort of self-deprecating and honest and whatever. So we did a whole bunch of ads saying what you want. And it was all this cool stuff, including a sports car. And then what you're getting, and it was all this family related versions of the good stuff it's making um, me smile already <laughs> yeah and it was because obviously it's come from a a genuine observation um 
and B, it's very appropriate to Volkswagen. Um, and if you see it, you, it makes you feel like, yeah, I'm going to kind of be, uh, um, I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to get this thing for my kids. I want to be one of those guys who, you know, doesn't drive around in a selfish sports car. I've got kids. I'm going to do this for a bit. Um, so to me, that was fantastic. On the other side, we would sometimes get briefs on things like, I think, uh, you know, there'd be a discount on certain Volkswagens. And the main proposition would say something like, um, you know, it may be now you can have a great life or something. You think, God, what does that mean? And then you track through the brief and it would say, because it's discounted, you can get this. And if you get, and it was so convoluted, but they couldn't bring themselves to write 20% off. They think we've got to, essentially it's 20% discount, but we can't just say that. It's so dumb. We're BMP. We can't say the brief is tell people that's 20% discount. We've got to reinvent that into something much more interesting and different and intellectual. So sometimes there would be a real disconnect between just saying what it is you need to say and trying to reinvent it. So You know, uh, this topic makes me think that you know and you you said something i think which i think is key which is it depends on the personnel involved right because there are creators who are very strategic and and very business oriented in terms of they understand the client's world and and selling products where there are other creators that are more artistic and let's say a little bit detached from the business world and they're the ones after and but i i think that throughout the history of advertising, at least modern advertising would say from the 40s forward, that even if there wasn't a account planning or strategy or a creative brief, there was something that was there doing that work. And there were yeah. people that, that were doing that role, whether they were in the creative department or in the account department or in the media department, somebody was kind of guiding the the yeah. in fact i have a quote from bill bernbach about you know setting down the tracks for the creative man to follow in my yeah. mind that's a creative brief yeah, that is, and, that, and he he said that before there was account planning so i i i think what we're seeing is you know we've housed it in this department strategy and but i always say having a strategist doesn't mean that your work is automatically going to be better because that strategist might be bad yeah, you know totally. so but I think for most creative people, I think it's better to have something very, very restrictive and focused that you have to solve rather than, you know, occasionally uh, we would get people coming into our office, possibly planners, saying, good news, Volkswagen or whoever it may be have said, not sure what the brief is, just enjoy yourself. And there's nothing less enjoyable because you think, and, and that would, it doesn't happen much, but there was about three times in my career, someone would turn up and say, essentially do what you want. It doesn't mean, you know, there's no commitment to buy whatever we wanted to do, which was- a Give problem. me but, give me the freedom of a tightly written brief fight. Uh, yeah. 100%. So it, you think, well, there's so many options. I can't even begin to put pen to paper. So there's a sort of lack of understanding who's saying that. That's, well, that's not what we want to do. I mean, if you give us a very- very very tight focused brief and say and we'll buy whatever you do on it then brilliant but if you say do whatever you want and then they probably won't buy it because it's because they don't know what they want it's not that's no fun but you know. yeah that's there's a concept an ancient concept that describes that and i've talked about it in my blog and in my books it's called liberating constraint yeah. the creative brief constrains you and by that constraint you're liberated your, your imagination yeah, you is allowed to, to yeah, yeah, you're resisting against some constraint and that frees your imagination. Totally, you know, yeah. one of the things that Henry and I have talked about in the past is the dearth of good training for young people coming into our business. Art direction, copywriting, you know, brief writing, account, you know, ma client management, things like that. Do you have any thoughts on that, the status or the state of training for young people in the business today? And have you talked uh, to others about it, shared it with young students perhaps? Yeah, I, I've talked to, uh, I mean, I think it's all down to the same thing. I think it probably comes from fees being halved or, you know, quartered or, yeah, and then, you know, when agencies used to be structured like the football league, there would be, you know, very senior and they gradually scroll down, whereas now 
certainly in the UK, it's like there may be one or two very senior people. And then there's loads of people on skateboards with love bikes on their neck. You know, it's like there's not much in the middle. It's it's just so so it's hard to get a lot of the time of the people at the top because they're covering so much. So often it, it sort of creates a system where it's kind of you throw it against the wall and you hope really rather than, you know, when I've done my um, podcast or interviews with, with people like Tom McGelliger or if you talk to someone like David Abbott or I'm sure Dave Trot is they will all talk about this same system, particularly the writers of, of taking their, their copy into their bosses and it being you know, crossed out and changed and the, the sort of slight pain and humiliation of keep doing it again and again. But obviously a couple of years in, they've learned a ton of stuff and they're better miraculously. And I think that is doesn't happen very much now in any of the, certainly the creative disciplines. You know, I used to be forever sending people away with, you know, it's, with things that are not right. And I think that there's... Um, I think that probably people are a bit more gentle now than they were, and there's sort of good and bad sides to that. But I think if you used to take your copy into Tim Delaney, he wasn't a gentle guy. Um, and it would be a problem if you didn't get it right. So you'd have to really pay attention. And I think now it's, it's not quite as harsh or, and I think it all links to the same. If it's not as well respected as it once was, you think, well, kind of says what we've got to say. I mean, why do we have to reinvent the wheel? How long have we got? It's got to go out in an hour. Um, so I think there's a lot of issues like that around it. I think um, it depends on your sort of aspiration. I suppose that I, the things that I really like, you know, some of the uh, ads that we may mention, like The Economist or the uh, Apple, or there is, to me, they're equivalent to other things in art or other, they're as good as you can get. So if you want to do something like that, it's it's really tough. And I think that um, it seems like there's less people that uh, aim as high. There's still some, you see, still see some great stuff around and there's some great people, but it, yeah. Are you, well, as we wrap things up and we're coming up on about an hour, are you hopeful for the future of our profession? What are your thoughts? Well, well it, it's generally... Um, it's generally cyclical and these things change. And I suppose my hope would be that some some young, aggressive people say, this is all bullshit. Why produce such dull, boring stuff? Let's have a bit of a revolution. So, you know, I, I forever, uh, if I do interviews with people in the States, I seem to be, ref, you know, referencing the New York Art Directors Club books. And there are sort of five year chunks where it really flattens out and there's, not much there and then all of a sudden Tom McGilligan and Dan Wyatt and the people turn up and all of a sudden the annual is amazing and then it flattens and then things happen so I would be hopeful that you know that people are as I say it, it needs a new generation to come in and and sort of reject what's gone before it really um, and you know if you were sort of starting again you'd think well let's do things that people like that are fun that have got some energy that are different that you know all these things that we kind of know but it doesn't seem like that's a philosophy that lots of people are doing i think it seems it, it's got far more like the world i guess it's got far more money orientated than it was um mm. so i'd like to be optimistic i mean it's partly why i do my put stuff out you hope it's of, of some use to people you know um, yeah i hear you we hear you there yeah Thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yes, it's been great. Thank you for joining us, Dave. We appreciate it. And we're going to remind our viewers. Uh, we have now almost 100 subscribers on our YouTube page. So we're, you know, slowly climbing the, the ladder cool. of, of listenership. Started out with, you know, five or six <laughs> when we first started. But, yeah, yeah, you know, cool. We're, keep we're plugging just, away is our philosophy. And, yeah, keep away. And, and the good thing is this stuff stays up there. So as people yeah. discover, oh, it, they'll hopefully yeah. be exposed. And we've been really fortunate to get great and thoughtful guests like yourself. So thank you yeah. so much, uh, Dave Dye, for joining us. Uh, DaveDye.com. Anywhere else on LinkedIn, Dave Dye. Um, 
Yeah. Re- reach reach out and bug him. Maybe he can uh, do talks. For, do you do? You, are you familiar with the SCA School of Communication Arts down in London? Yeah, yeah, I've taught there for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I did it. I did a class online class with them last week, and and Mark Lewis was a guest on our show. Yeah, he's lovely. A few Mark. Few, yeah. few weeks ago. So again, Dave, thank you so much. We appreciate thank it. You. My pleasure. Thanks, enjoy, guys. Enjoy, enjoy you. yourself. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach, and together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time, bye-bye.